here. Well, there we go. All right, so let's get started. Hey, everybody, this is Stephanie from Hope and the Radio, and today I'm interviewing Chris Newcomb from the Richmond, Virginia area. That's right. So, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your music? Sure, sure. Thanks for having me on. I, I love what you're doing with this radio show and station. It's really cool. Um, so I'm from Richmond, Virginia. It's about two hours south of D.C. And uh, born and raised here, um, except for college and grad school. I've lived here my whole life. And uh, I remember music was always in my, it was always around me. And um, my parents gave me three records as a kid, a Kiss record, an Elvis record, and a Kenny Rogers record, which is pretty like very wide. And um, my dad raised me on jazz. He liked jazz. And I, for me, Kiss, Kiss kind of did it. You know, I, you know, the face pain, the whole deal. I just that it captured my imagination as a kid. But then I have memories uh, like 1983. When I was about 10. That's when I really started to become aware of music. Like I remember specifically hearing Rio from Duran Duran and paying attention to John Taylor playing bass and that whole busy bass line. Um, I, I distinctly remember that. You know, um, my mom tells me when I was a kid. Uh, we would ride around, and, and uh, Paul Simon's uh, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover would be on, and I'd be in the back seat at five years old singing it. <laughs> but I, I couldn't speak really well, so instead of saying lover with a V, I would say lubber with a B. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, yeah, music has always been, been a part of my life. I'm really grateful for it. So many songs and melodies and lyrics have affected my life in positive ways, so, yeah. I love music. Really grateful for it. What type of genres of music do you write? Um, I, I kind of, I've oscillated between, well, those three records really kind of were the formation. Um, I would say at, at heart, I'm a rocker, but my first instrument was bass. So I was schooled on funk and R&B and that kind of stuff too. And, and I love the storytelling of country. So really what I try to do is write what the song calls for, whatever the muse kind of, you know, directs me to do, then I go that way. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big Prince fan and, um, you know, he could write across so many different genres. And so I just really try to hone into the song and uh, what it calls for. So if it calls for, you know, a little bit of a rock beat, then cool. If it's, you know, Hey, lay back and do a disco thing, then I'll do that. Um, you know, because the song is everything. And so I, I try to be open to that. Um, I don't write polka. Um, not, not a speed metal guy, <laughs> not going to see me cranking out a speed metal album, nothing wrong with speed metal. Um, but those, you know, so kind of a combination of rock country and R&B and, and blues would be a good. Very cool. And what is your creative process like? So I, um, it really depends. I have this running list on my phone of notes of song titles and lyrics that I'll get anywhere. Conversation with you, uh, watching TV, uh, a billboard, and it will it will pop into my head. Like I was at a bar one time with a, watching a friend play and this other guy next to me was having uh, a birthday. So the waitress was giving him shots and I thought they were together. So I was like, oh, is that your girlfriend? He's like, no. And, and kiddingly, I just said, oh, she's my tonight. Like, you know, he was gonna date her that night. And we kind of laughed about it. And then I thought, wait a minute, that's a song title. And so I just put it on my phone and, you know, a year later or so, I saw that title and was like, oh, write about this woman who's, who's, who's both present now and has been in our history and is going to be in the future. But it was based off this joke. You know, so it happens that way. Sometimes I'll pick up a guitar and I'll just, I'll just start playing chords and something comes out or I'll fiddle around in an alternative tuning and something will be there. Um, and then uh, sometimes it goes dry. I've gone for a year without writing a song before. And, um, you know, just walked in the room, I'm vacuuming, and I see my guitar, and I'm like, not yet. <laughs> and it's just looking at me like, dude, what, what what's going on, man? Come on. And then it'll come back. So, so really, it, it just depends on um, what I'm feeling. But I've gotten songs on piano. I've gotten them from bass. I've gotten them from, you know, drum beat um, and, and lyrics, too. Um, I, I have a joke with my friend. I often, I don't know if you guys know Cracker Barrel restaurants, but they're kind of a southern thing. But they... Um, 
They have really good breakfasts. So you know, you know Cracker Barrel. So I went to Cracker Barrel one time, and I was in the little little shop waiting to get on the table, and I picked up this country CD, and one song had the word lonesome in it, and the other song had the word cologne in it. And for whatever reason, my eyes picked up lonesome and cologne and put it together. And I was like, that's a country song. <laughs> that's a country song title. And then this whole story downloads into my head. I'm literally writing it on my phone, and I'm telling the waitress, uh, Mama's Pancake Breakfast with Orange Juice, and I'm like, writing it out. It's basically the song about a guy who, um, he's an older guy. He's kind of been a player with women, but he's realizing maybe I shouldn't be that way. He wants to turn over a new leaf. But whenever he goes and sees his favorite cologne, all bets are off. And he, he, he goes to the bar and meets, meets somebody. But at the end of the song, I, I wanted it to be a lesson. So at the end of the song, he realizes maybe, maybe it's not the cologne that smells good. Maybe it's, maybe he's not all that clean on the inside and maybe wants to change. So that's just one of the ways that a song came to me. Thank you for sharing that. Would you like to play something? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, let me let me grab my kiss real quick. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. One second. So, uh, actually, I can play that song. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear it. Let me know if you can pick up the guitar. I meant to tune real quick. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was going to play. Where are you, where are you calling from? I'm in Fresno, California, but I grew up in New York. Okay. I used to go to Cracker Barrel all the time. <laughs> Did you? So you know it? Yeah. <laughs> I love the restaurant. <laughs> you, I was like, they don't know who it is. They're like, what kind of like Southern redneck show is, you know, or, or places that, you know, great food. There we go. I don't know. Can you hear that that guitar? Do you hear it? Okay. All right. Let me just grab a capo here real quick. Sorry. Had it on the wrong cable. All right, this is called Lonesome Cologne. Um, will you do me a favor and give me a, a thumbs up if you can hear my voice and the guitar if they sound all right together? Because I can't tell. Yeah, so. Whoa, it's going out of tune. Don't do that. I love California. I could live there in a heartbeat. It's beautiful. I love it out here. It's so, it's so beautiful. Did you like, uh, I was following your uh, post about Thailand. It was Thailand you went to? Mm-hmm. Was it good? Uh, Philippines. Philippines. To the Philippines. It yeah. was amazing. Um, I went to Manila, and then I went to Cebu, and then I um, hung, hung out with my friends in the Calico area. And they took me to Tagate. They took me to Balian. It's like a little town next to where they live. And um, the beach resort, I think, Ionian, which is in, I can't remember the name of it, but it was right in the water. It was, it was just beautiful. I was there for two weeks. And I got to really immerse myself in the culture there and try their food. And, That's a um, lot. It, it was, I, I want to go back and visit. <laughs> That's great. That, that, that's <laughs> so many places I didn't get to see. I was going to have seen, but <laughs> yeah, that's but maybe cool. next year. Um, <clears throat> I have not been there. It'll probably be on the list at some point. Um, mm -hmm. So this is uh, Lonesome Cologne. Mm -hmm. 
Whiskers growing like weeds in my yard My reflection says that I've been living hard I smile and wink and I begin to think Do I want to try again? So I reach my hand to my favorite Social commodity, a little splash, I head out the door. Cause I'm wearing my lonesome cologne, I can't go wrong. Draw the ladies like a moth to a flame. That famous scent covers the years I spent playing this lonesome game. There she is, my next wonder queen. I wonder, can she see in between? My smell good smile and my lion eyes. Making my perfect pitch once again. So I reach my hand to her ear. Whisper something sweet I catch her smile I know it's on Cause I'm wearing my lonesome cologne I can't go wrong Draw the ladies like a moth to a flame That famous scent covers the years I spent Playing this lonesome game like the spice of old, I'm good as gold, but I smell the stench inside. Maybe it's my heart that ain't alive when I'm wearing my lonesome cologne. I can't go wrong, draw the ladies like a moth to a flame. That famous scent covers the years I spent Playing this lonesome game Playing this lonesome game I've been playing Playing a lonesome Lonesome game Whiskers growing like weeds in my yard Thank you. Thank, thank you, Avery. Uh, thank yeah, you. It's, uh, it's the Cracker Barrel song. <laughs> no, it's nothing. Um, so, Chris, can you tell us what have been some of your challenges um, when writing music? Uh, oh, wow. Um, well, quite a bit. Uh, when I was 17, I um, gave myself, or got somehow, double tendonitis in each wrist, and they told me I'd never play again. So I, <clears throat> all I wanted to do was to music. So I gave it up and I, I would play on my own, but never played, didn't play in a band or anything. And then um, in 2011, I was on a YouTube site for guitar and it had nothing to do with songwriting. I'd never written a song in my life. And um, <clears throat> the guy said something about this diatonic scale and I had never heard of it. And I thought, wait a minute, if you have a guitar riff, but you don't have, you don't hear a melody in your head, but you have the scale, you could write a song. So I grabbed my guitar, wrote out like the key of A, had a riff, bang, song came out. Clearly not a hit. But I was like, wait a minute, that's never happened. <laughs> so the next day I'm like, nah, it's not gonna happen again. You know, and I take another riff, bang, song comes out. Now in school, lyrics and writing was my strength. So the lyric part wasn't as big of a deal. It was trying to get the music to come together. And um, <clears throat> so I, I was like, well, wow. So I started writing and I took a year and I wrote about 100 songs in a year. I got up at like five in the morning every day and wrote. And then I started hearing melodies in my head, which was the weirdest thing in the world. I'd wake up at three in the morning, stumble into my office, like ah, singing to my phone and, and then try to figure it out the next day. And then um, what was the real challenge was growing up, I, I was told not to sing. Like in a play in rock band, they were like, you don't sing. Mm -mm. And so, you know, I, I hated the sound of my voice for like three decades, literally speaking voice, singing voice, couldn't stand it. And when I started writing my own songs, I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to just go to a lesson. 
But I was so scared. I brought my laptop with me with my song on my laptop. So when the teacher said, let's sing, I went space bar and just stood back and let her hear my voice through my computer. Wouldn't sing in front of her. And then she said, um, well, let's do, let's do um, the national anthem. And I go, no, Whitney Houston does the national anthem. I don't do the national anthem. And she kind of laughed. And um, anyway, I, I didn't realize that... Um, Apparently, I had this wide vocal range that I did not know I had. Um, and she's like, well, you have, you have a four-octave vocal range. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Like, you're, 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 not, you're not counting the keys correctly, <laughs> you know? And she says, no, you, you can sing Don Henley. And I go, oh, Don Henley from Nebraska, because I know you don't mean Don Henley from the Eagles. That guy sold a ton of records. And she's like, no, you'll be fine. So whatever. So I started to work on the voice, and it was really, really challenging for me. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because I had to make a decision. If I'm going to be a singer-songwriter, am I just going to go get a singer? Or am I going to take the time it takes to learn to sing? And what does all that mean? And how long does it, you know, go? So um, I've had a couple of vocal coaches. And then, um, but I was having this issue where I would, when I sing, I would gag, which sounds really strange. But when you sing, you lift up your soft palate in the back where your little uvula hangs. And um, I have been to doctors and uh, coaches and nobody could figure it out and only recently is it I'm beginning to figure out what it was or what it is and there's some muscularity issues but um, <clears throat> I have a vocal cord disorder it's called presbyphonia and it's it basically your your cords don't close together all the way so you have to do um, these exercises to try to strengthen the muscles around them to get the cords to come together and I have I have a speaking issue which is called dysphonia and uh, apparently I've been speaking incorrectly my whole life which is always good to figure that out a little later in life. <laughs> so I, I'm like, you know, sitting at home going, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, and leather, yellow, blue, and then I get all messed up. So uh, it's been an absolute, um, almost like a, a battle for me to get to where I'm at. And if it wasn't for, you know, I believe that my gifts are from God, and I, I believe that um, if there weren't little breakthroughs that had come through, uh, I probably would have thrown the towel in, but um, it seems to keep, you know, slowly progressing and, and opening up. And um, I, I, um, so yeah, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge because at the end of the day, you know, if you want to, if you want to be really successful in music and whatever that looks like, because it can be all kinds of levels, you know, it's not, it's not a career. Your mom and dad go, you should go try to be a rock star. You know, they go, um, go ahead and get your degree and then go do this. And there's nothing wrong with that. I have a master's, so I've done that. You know, I, I've gone down that road and there's nothing wrong with it. And there's nothing wrong with it if you don't. Um, so for my family, it's kind of like, are you sure about that? <laughs> you know, you know um, and, you know, quite honestly, my age, I'm 50. And, you know, some people are like, you lost your mind. And I'm like, no, songs don't, a good song does not, rest on how old the songwriter is or when it was written. See Beethoven. You play those notes and people still hear it all around the world and they still know that song. Beethoven's Ninth. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing and I admire you for being able to keep moving forward with your passion regardless of what obstacles you would face. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a challenge and, and so, you know, it's, it's fun for me to be able to give back to musicians in my area or wherever if they're struggling and be like, Hey, I get it. Here's, here's, mm -hmm. you know, here's what you can do. Mm -hmm. whatever. So what do you, what do you wish you have known when you were first starting out? Um, it's well, one, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's absolutely a marathon. Um, I wish I had known vocally speaking. I wish I had known that, um, that my voice is okay, that I have the only voice like mine anywhere, just as anybody else on the planet has only their voice, and that the voice is powerful. It's an expression of who you are, what you think, what you feel, and owning that voice. Um, you know, for a long time, I, I didn't feel like I could, you know, I'm an empath, I'm, I'm the highly sensitive songwriter, <laughs> so I didn't have that um, sort of innate confidence at the time to be able to just speak, you know, what I think. And, and so songwriting has helped me do that. It's helped me open up and, you know, I have something to say about something, you know, 
And um, uh, I think also not to listen to the haters, to really, you know, just, um, you know, like sometimes the other day I was writing and I was, I was recording and it wasn't going well. It was raining and I went outside, went for a walk. I had my headphones on and something told me to put on like motivational videos from YouTube and listen to the audio. So I was walking, listening to it. And it's like, you know, the guy's like, you will never stop. You can't do it, you know, but some of you are lazy. And I'm like, I'm not the lazy guy, but you could do it. So I'm walking and I'm like, I'm not feeling it, but, but about, I'm like, like two miles on the back half of the last mile. It was like, something just clicked in my head and uh, I'm releasing my first record and the, and the goal for the record to be done is February 22nd of next year because my birthday is the 23rd. And since I'm 50, I would like to have a complete album in my 50th year, which I call halftime in my life. And it was like something just flipped and I just was walking. I was saying to myself, anybody can do anything for 88 days, which is how many days at the time I had left. It was like, anybody can do anything for 88 days. And so I have this little board behind me that, um, that I, I every day write off the number and 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 do that and um, you know I read a quote once that says it's hard to beat the guy that won't quit and that's true in anything you know I mean like you I think you got your didn't you get your master's in L, NLP or something yeah I have my master's in in well I recently just got my master's in NLP coaching um, but I also have a master's degree in library science and in clinical psychology so I've been in school for quite a bit. <laughs> wow, so you but... <laughs> three masters, huh? Thank you. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's really good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Chris, what do you think has been your biggest accomplishment so far in songwriting? Um the biggest accomplishment first would be just writing a song. Just just writing a song. Because I never thought I could. So that in and of itself was like cherry on the on the Sunday because it was like wait a minute where'd this come from having an out-of-body experience um mm. after that I would say uh I have my songs on SoundCloud and really they just sit there uh, most of them are marked private and it's just so I can share with people like hey can you check this out tell me what you think you know I'll go back tweak stuff but some of it's there and I I really get like seven eight plays a week right I mean I'm rocking it you know <laughs> and and it's okay I'm not marketing I'm not expecting it so somehow I got on a on a, a iCloud playlist. Somebody put me on one. So I go on there, and the pro version will tell you um, how many plays in, in cities and countries around the world. And I look over at the number, and it's like 1,400 plays. And I'm arguing with the algorithm. I'm like, you lie, algorithm. You have a math LD algorithm. There's no way I have 1,400 plays. And I couldn't figure it out. And then I figured out somebody put my song on a thing. So I started looking at the demographics and I was blown away that my songs, apparently, unless SoundCloud is lying and I've done lots of research to make sure they're not, because if they are, it would really suck. But my songs have been played in a hundred countries. And for me, that, I mean, it's, you know, it's a gift from God. I'm, I'm grateful to God. It totally blew my mind and it, it encouraged me incredibly because the bar to get into the music industry now is super, super low. The, the bar to get heard is high because there's so much noise with social media. And to know that somebody somewhere liked my song anywhere, I thought it's going to be like 20 miles around my house. Well, it turns out the United States is the biggest place people play, but the second is Indonesia. Who'd have thought? I know no one in Indonesia, can't speak it, never met an Indonesian, no idea. But how cool that somebody there likes something I wrote, you know? Um, and so it's, 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 you know, I just laugh. I'm like, somebody in Turkey, like Pakistan, you know, South Africa, um, you know? And, and so that, that to me is, it, it's just a gift. You know, if, if I were to die today, which I'm not planning on doing, but if I were to die today and nothing ever happened with music, that's enough for me. That's enough for me because I never thought I would ever do that. So, you know, and and if it and, and truly if the song affects somebody in a positive way, that that's that's gold. I mean, that's you know, why do we go back and listen to the same songs over and over and over again? Because it's a guitar lead, a melody. You know, I can listen to Adele, somebody like you, someone like you. And I can cry from the piano in the beginning because it's in that minor key 
and the production has that reverb that makes it so spacious. And that's cool. You know, and I sometimes think about when I start writing songs and I'm like, hey, I'd like to kind of have a verb effect. Ah, Adele. She had that spacious thing going, you know. Pink Floyd did it. They were big with it. So that would be, and being interviewed. I mean, I never thought anybody would interview. They want to talk to me about music that I do. So it's pretty cool. I, I think it's amazing that you're able to get your music so spread out like that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's a, uh, it's 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 fun, and I'm, I'm, um, uh, the album that I'm putting out uh, tentatively is titled "Experiencing Imperfection," and I wrote a song called "Experiencing Imperfection," and I call it my ode to low testosterone. <laughs> the reason I say that is because I was, mm -hmm. was years ago, I was having a hard time sleeping, and I thought I suspected maybe I did, and I went to my doctor, and he's like, "Yeah, but it's like low normal." So I'm thinking he's going to give me medication. He doesn't. So I go home. I'm angry because I'm still not going to sleep well pick up the pen and then mm -hmm. experiencing imperfection crosses my mind because that's what I was experiencing because things weren't going the right way. Mm -hmm. And so the album is, is going to be called Experiencing Imperfection. And, and, you know, I think it's universal because we all do. And there's no perfect in the world. I mean, I think, you know, you can set excellence as your goal, but there's no perfect. And But I'm also mm -hmm. releasing it with my first book together. Um, and so each each chapter of the book on the facing page will have the lyrics of the song from the record. And then we'll have um, a life story of mine, and then you know, kind of tie in what the lyrics mean and how you might, how you might be able to apply it in your life, you know. So um, that sounds good. Yeah, put the two together. And... Do you do you want to play another song? Sure. Uh, um, I can play. Uh, let's see. I can play "Spirits and Imperfection" if you want. That goes. Let me, sorry, let me just double check my tuning real quick. Who's your, since you, you have a list of music with the music station, who's your favorite all-time artist? I have so many, um, but um, I love Brian Adams. He's, he's one of my top favorites. Have you seen him live? <laughs> long, long time ago, I, back in like the late 90s, I was like, I was like a him now. I know he did a tour last year, I think. Um, I saw him Maybe about one day. I saw him maybe three years ago. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, sure. So good. Where did you see him? I saw him in D.C. In Washington. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. And he, uh, mm -hmm. the dude still sounds like the record live. He, he really does. Mm -hmm. He sounds like the record live. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he did, my, one of my favorite songs, of course, he did with Tina Turner is, um, you know, yeah. Only Love. You know, that yeah. dun, dun. Yeah, and he, when he started playing that, I was like, "Ah, oh, yes!" It's like a. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is uh, this is Lonesome Cologne. <laughs> Caught like a dog without a bone, no place to rest, my weary head. I'm thinking about days, days gone by, the likes of which are dead. I want to be free from all that binds me, running in a field of dreams despite me, releasing myself from life's cruel pain, feeling the ecstasy of release, oh Lord. Take this pain away from me But I keep experiencing imperfection Watching perfect go down the train I'm standing in a rainstorm of deception me to the flame cannon fodder am I a bother life's crosshairs aimed at me it seems that life requires for free a trip through pain's symphony oh lord take this pain away from me Experience. 
dancing in perfection Watching perfect go down the drain I'm standing in a rainstorm of deception While life holds me to the flame Watching perfect go down the train And I'm standing in a rainstorm of deception While life holds me to the flame While life teaches me its game stays the same caught like a dog without a bone <laughs> uh, thank you I really like that you have such a pretty voice so. oh thank you so much I appreciate it for all you guys out there watching if you have low testosterone you might experience imperfection <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Chris, what do you think helped you become successful in songwriting? What, uh, what, what, what will make me successful? Is that what you said? What do you think helped you become successful in oh, songwriting? Um, uh, trial and error, one, for sure. Uh, a, a willingness to fail and fail big. Like, just, I've written dumb songs. I mean, they are. And, and, but it's okay. I like them because it was, it was a formation. It started to get me to figure things out. And, and then it's, um, it's not trying to follow a trend. It, you know, it's, if you look at the major artists that have had long careers, generally they don't follow trends. They may bring a little bit in from something, pull in just a, you know, as a touch, as a touchstone to where they are in time. But you're not going to see Bon Jovi put out a polka album, and you're not going to see Drake put out a heavy metal album. It's not who they are, right? But who they are is why they are who they are and why they, why they are. So I think any success that I have is, is really just trying to stay true to who I am and what I want to say because I, I'm very careful when I write lyrics because I can't, I've got to sing it. And if I can't back it up, honestly, then I'm not singing it. You know, so um, I wrote, there was a movie out not too long ago called The Sound of Freedom or Sound of Freedom. And it's a true story about uh, an FBI agent who got, um, kids out of um, human trafficking and I had written a song five years prior called Run Angel Run. I used to work as a mental health um, executive director at a mental health uh, facility and I had a lady who had experienced domestic violence and I was really angry after I heard her story and so at lunch break the next day I got out my guitar and started writing this song Run Angel Run and I lost the audio for it. Well I was sitting in the theater watching Sound of Freedom and Run Angel Run pops into my head, and I'm like, it's still about that struggle. So I came home, picked up my guitar, wrote the song in 15 minutes. But then when I started writing the words, I realized I had to be very, very careful about what I was going to say, because it's a really charged topic, one. Two, it's about children. So, you know, you got to be very careful about what you're writing. So I really spent a lot of time carving that song to make sure that every word I could sing, I believed and it was true, it wasn't exaggerated, and it was, um, it fit the song, and it moved the song forward. So um, I think those are elements that can make, that make for good songwriting. At least all the people I listen to, that's, that's what they do, you know? So I, and I try to, I just try to be a, a, learn, a learner, you know? Because um, I, I don't know it all. Shock. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you. Um, you mentioned your album. Is there anything else that's coming up for you in the near future? The album and the book are the big thing right now. Um, I've just, just been recording mm -hmm. that and uh, getting it right. And uh, I, I play some op open mic nights around town here just to kind of test some songs out. But really, if I'm if I have a waking moment, I'm usually in the studio, trying to you know get this the way I, you know they say you have your whole life to write your first record and 18 months to write your second. So, you know I know that I mean, the way I look at it is the world is not waiting for a Chris Newcomb record and they're not waiting for a Chris Newcomb book. That plays in my favor, because that gives me the time to really take take time and and really massage it and make it what it can be. And if it fails. I already think it's a success because I like it, you know, and if somebody else likes it, that's even better. That, that's even, you know, more icing on the cake. So, yeah, the record and the book are the main thing, and I may go to Disneyland. I don't know. <laughs> or I, I was telling my friend, I'm like, they got to stop liking my music in Indonesia. It's a day plane flight. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> if I, I guess, I'm sure the Philippines was, was pretty far f for you, wasn't it? It was like at least, I think, like 15 hours to get there. And then on the way back, I had to do a 12 hour layover in Taiwan. So it took me like two days to get home. Really? But, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I, I had a listener in Taiwan. It might have been you. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a beautiful country. I, I know there's so much to see, there's so much to do, like the culture of their of the people and, and it was amazing, just very collective, very family oriented. Yeah. Um, so, so generous. Um, the food was delicious. I, oh, yeah. I, I tell you, I, um, I take a lot of Uber yeah. and Lyft rides around town, and um, I get drivers from all over the world. I mean, all different kinds of countries. And it's my, uh, the guy that's helped me produce my record kids me because he, because I, I play my songs for the Uber drivers because 99% of them have the radio on when I get in and I'm usually carrying a guitar. So they automatically ask, what do you do? And then I'll kind of fish around a little bit, you know, and I'm being altruistic. I'm not just like trying to use them. I, I, I'm generally interested in what they like. And then sometimes it, I don't go there and, and a lot of times I do and I'll play my, my songs for them. And it's really cool because I get to know, okay, here's a guy from Turkey. What does he think about a guy from Midlothian, Virginia, in the deep, you know, in the south of Amer you know, of, of the United States, writing rock songs. You know, or you know, I wrote an R and B song. It was a guy. I had um, two drivers from Uganda, and I had an R and B song that I played them. And uh, I'm sitting there going, it's "Probably not a good idea. You're a white guy. <laughs> you're not just a white guy. You're a redhead. <laughs> you know, and and I can barely count to four. <laughs> and and, uh, you know, they, uh, they liked the song. And I was like, that's so cool because that's, I mean, that's, that is where R&B and all that music comes from, from Africa. So, you know, to have somebody who's native of Africa to like a song, I was just like a kid in a candy store. So my, my, um, my producer says, Chris Newcomb, one Uber fan at a time. <laughs> and I said, it's grassroots, man. It's grassroots. <laughs> Um, Chris, what advice would you give to new songwriters in the field? Um, one, do it because you like it. And I'd say do it because you love it. And if you don't know if you love it, be willing to love it. And be willing, be willing to fail. The biggest thing is cutting off the inner critic in your head. The inner critic will tell you, you can't sing, you can't play guitar, you can't play bass, you can't, you're going to look goofy on stage. You, you know, girls or guys aren't going to like you. You won't be popular. You're too big of a stretch. Um, your lyrics are dumb, all these different things the inner critic's going to say. And so what I've learned is I just I just fire the inner critic in my head. I'm just like, uh, you, can, you can get out. I'm the chairman of the board in my head, so you can get out. So I would say do that, one. And then two, um, listen to a lot of different music. Listen to a lot of different music. But also, write the music you want to hear. And write the music that in, that you from your influences, and if you steal, steal well. That's what I was always told. You know, pull from artists that you like, and obviously you don't copy them, but you can get that influence, and that's how we get new cool music. Um, but you know, for a while, I was going to put out like a kind of a country record, and as I was working on this, 
my heart was like, not, nah, dude, actually, you're a rocker. You, your first record needs to be a rock record because you love rock. Let's put out a rock record first. And then the next record is going to be probably a pop R&B record. And the one after that is going to be a country record. So, um, so I would say, you know, be true to yourself and, and also co-write. Co-writing is a lot of fun, you know. And, um, you know, I, I wrote a song called I Think I'll Stay. It's an anti-suicide song. And uh, I, when I worked at the mental health facility, there was a, a young, young gentleman there, he's about 26 years old, who um, struggled really bad with hearing voices. And, but he, when he talked to you, he talked to you just like we are now. You couldn't tell that he was hearing voices. And it was really distressing for him. But he was also a singer and wanted to write songs. So, uh, but he didn't play guitar. So he sang something for me, and I was like, dude, you got a voice for radio. You really do. And he's like, all I ever want to do is music. I'm like, you should do it. So we started writing, I started helping with the chords for that guitar song and whatever. And um, unfortunately, in January of this year, um, the voices were too much, and he took his life. And um, so I don't, the reason I say that is because um, music has the power to change people. And um, when I play that song, I made, a, I made a commitment to him in my heart that when I would play that song, I would always mention his name. And I would say, this is a song I wrote with Caleb to keep him alive and the, and the melody alive. But what was really neat was at an um, open mic night the other night, um, these teen girls were there. And they had been there the week before and they had heard me sing that song. And they're like, are you going to play that song? And I'm like, what song? I'm not popular. <laughs> and they said that song. And I was, I was playing and I just smiled to myself because I know he would have been happy, you know? And um, so don't be afraid when you write songs to say what you need to say. Because the night I released that song, I Think I'll Stay, I was with dinner with a friend and I told them, I said, if it touches anybody's life, one person, it's worth it. 20 minutes later, I got a text from a family friend who said, I've been thinking about you for the past couple of days. I want to tell you about a God thing. I'm like, what? She's like, well, I saw your video come across Facebook about your, your anti-suicide song. I really liked it. She's like, later in the day, a friend of mine called me and said they wanted to kill themselves. I said, really? And she said, yeah, well, this was right when the national suicide number just changed to 988. And anybody can text or call 988 24 7 365. It's anonymous, it's confidential. I put that number in my video at the end of the video. And my friend did not know that number. But because she watched my video, she got the number and could tell her friend. And her friend called and changed her mind and decided not to do it and is alive. So, you know, I, I say that to say, say the truth in your songs, whatever it is. Don't be afraid to. Because I never thought I'd write a song on that subject. I mean, it's not like, you know, hey, I think I'll write a song on this. Like, no, but it came out of somewhere. Thank you for sharing. And it sounds like your music is really making a difference. And that's awesome. So, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we go? Um, let's see. I think it's amazing that people can create music out of nowhere, out of the air, and can write a lyric that will affect somebody's life. There's two lyrics that affected my life. One's by Don Henley, and the other's by Motley Crue. Of all bands. The Don Henley is, of course, part of the matter. And in the bridge, he says, there are people in your life who've come and gone. They let you down. You know they hurt your pride. You got to put it all behind you, babe, because life goes on. You keep carrying that anger. It'll eat you up inside. What a powerful message in a pop song, you know? And then the, the Motley Crue song um, is, uh, I, I got bullied as a kid, and um, it's, it's kind of an angry song, but, but he says, if you want to live life on your own terms, you got to be willing to crash and burn. And I thought, you know, when you when you make life choices, you know, that's true. And so I think like as an artist, one of the things I encourage other artists is to choose health and wellness in your life. If you're a singer, your guitar player, whatever, take care of your body because it, it's what you need if you want to do this because it's not an easy life. It's amazing just with the lyrics alone, like you said, how much impact they can have on people. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's all they really need. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I, you know, last very quickly, I, I used to work in substance abuse uh, circles, and um, I, the, you know, the song by Chumbawamba, Tub Thumping. I get knocked down. <laughs> I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so, yeah. And drinking, right? Which is fine. It, neither here nor there. But when I would talk to people who 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 had a little bit of a problem with drinking, uh, I would bring that song. They're like, "It's a great song, man. This song really rocks." And I'm like, "It does." I said, "Here's something to consider. Since you're you're making a choice to do something different in your life because it, you know alcoholism runs in your family or whatever," I said, "The way I interpret that song is for me has nothing to do with alcohol. The way I interpret it is, I get knocked down." I get back up again. I get knocked down. Mm-hmm. I get back up again. You're never going to keep me down. Mm-hmm. But that's not what the songwriter, you know, inter- when he wrote it, that's not what the interpretation of the song is supposed to be. So it's funny how you can mm-hmm. pull a lyric from something that is not the meaning of the song the writer wrote, but you mm-hmm. get something out of it. Every time I hear that song, yeah. I just kind of laugh during the, you know, mm-hmm. lock drink. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Chris, thank you so, so much for being here. Um, as for everybody, the hope, the interview will be on Hope and Love Radio Station tomorrow at noon. Also be on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And I'll also put it in my email newsletter. Hope okay. everybody has a wonderful weekend. And we'll speak to you all soon. All right. Awesome. Okay. So let me stop.